over its body other than the face itself. There are in fact four different types of uh, you know what we think of as Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Very wide, pronounced nose. There was also a very ominous uh, odor. Phase one is to identify opportunities. I walked into a small clearing uh, and less than 10, 15 feet away from uh, this enormous creature and uh, it scared the living hell out of me. Phase two is conducting investigations both of witnesses and locations. The size of the thing, it was, you know, four or five feet across the shoulders. Phase three is profiling research areas, what's there, how they move, feeding, things like that. About eight feet tall, I guess around 800 pounds, it was massive. I had no idea that anything like that existed. Phase four is create an intercept plan. I decided to shoot in the air to see if maybe it would scare it off. Phase five is the intercept and resolve the issue phase. It didn't do anything, didn't react. And then I heard a noise from my right rear and from out behind some brush come another one and walked over by the first one. That's when I decided to do what the dog did. I took off running. Welcome to Witness of the Unknown. Hello, everyone. I'm speaking with Tom today. Tom, how are you, my friend? I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you, Will? I'm good. I'm good. Let's um, let's go back to when you first got some interest in the subject, and then kind of you know tell us what uh, you know what led you to getting interested in the subject, and uh, and it will go from there as far as what you. Uh, have experienced yourself. Okay. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, I read an, a magazine article about Bigfoot, and it was basically about uh, an encounter that uh, happened in Northern California back in the early 60s where a logging crew had found footprints after being off for the weekend, and they noticed also some oil drums moved around and uh, reported it to the local newspaper, and it hit probably the AP, UPI. And this was an article in a magazine. I don't know if it was Argosy, but it was a men's artic, uh, magazine, and that's where I first got interested in the subject. Uh, after that, of course, I saw the Patterson-Gimlin film and got more interested in it because there was actually a living, breathing creature that had been filmed. So I started picking up any of the, the books I could find, which mo mainly in those days were small pocketbook paperbacks, and uh, this is way before the internet or anything like that, so you'd see uh, things on TV like In Search Of and uh, uh, TV series with uh, any mention of Bigfoot I was always interested in, always looking in the TV guide, and for a while there they were on quite often, and then it sort of dried up for a while. Yeah, there so wasn't my a great deal out there. there. Yeah, there was no, when we did before right internet, I mean, you know, you had to go to the library and look up things, and there was even that was was limited. So uh, that's how I got interested in the subject. And then my brother, who ha actually had this encounter, he's 13 years younger than I am, but he also had the same interest. So he knew about Bigfoot. I knew about Bigfoot. So when he related this incident to me, it wasn't a surprise. It was just a location that was a surprise to me. Well, tell me what happened with that situation. Well, it was, I'm trying to remember the exactly, it was late September, early October 1984. I got a call from my brother one evening after I was home from work, and he said, "I guess what I saw uh, earlier this week. And I thought, well, maybe he's on vacation. He was up in uh, Sierras, Sierras or something. I said, I have no idea what. He said, a Bigfoot. Said, You've got to be crazy. Where? And he said, Simi Valley. And I said, oh, come on. So he related this story to me. Um, this was probably Wednesday of this week, uh, that, of that week. On Monday, 
after he had gotten home from work, he and some friends were hanging out, and one of his friends related this story that happened to a, a guy that he didn't know on Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening. Uh, he was coming back from playing with his four-wheeler and had his son on the back of the four-wheeler uh, and taking it home. And as they were riding at home, his son poked him on the back and said, What's that? He said, Where? Look to your right. And there was this hair-covered bipedal creature about 30 yards away paralleling them, running as fast as they were going. So he hit the gas and took off. They went over a little embankment and crashed the four-wheeler. He picked up his son and ran home. Uh, Later, uh, the next day, he went back and retrieved the four-wheeler. And so my brother said, well, that sounds like a Bigfoot. Can it be? So they went over to the guy's house that afternoon and talked to him, and they decided that they were going to go out, him and a couple of his friends, that evening over to the field and uh, see what they could find. Now, this field, I'm looking at a map of uh, Simi Valley on the Internet. Thank God for that. It really shows you some some, uh, streets and locations. There's a place north of Simi Valley called the Mar Ranch Open Space, and it was just to the west of that. And there's nothing up there. If you go into the Internet, Will, and put in uh, Presidio Drive, it'll show you a street that's got homes on one side and rolling hills and barren land on the other. Now, when we went out there, that field had weeds. Of course, in the fall, they were all dried up, but they were two to three feet tall. And I was told that that was oil company land, but I never saw any oil derricks or explorations or whatever. But there were plenty of dirt roads and trails back up there in the hills. So anyways, he went home, got his friends together. My dad even went out with them, and they went out there about 9 o'clock at night and started roaming the fields, and nothing. Uh, There was rabbits. There were crickets. There were all kinds of bugs making noises and whatever, but they didn't see anything at all. So they called it a night about 10.30 and went home and decided they would go back out the next night and see what they could find. So on Tuesday night, They went back out there. Again, my dad didn't go with them this time. It was about, again, 9 o'clock at night, and they started roaming the field, and they had flashlights with them, but that was all. They're trying to be quiet and whisper between them and whatever, but they were probably 30, 40 yards apart. And suddenly at the back of this one location, there was a, a, a dirt road that paralleled the main street, and it was a little bit up on the hillside. So one of them poked their flashlight up there and sure enough they thought they saw something duck behind this big boulder and uh every time they put the flashlights down this thing would come out and they put the flashlights it would duck back over the behind the boulder so they all of them put their flashlights up there and sure enough they saw a head sticking out and an arm just like the typical tree peeking and it was hair covered and uh after a while it didn't move they just kept peeking out and going they decided to get the heck out of there so they went back the next day, which would be Wednesday morning, and my brother measured the rock, and the rock was like 10 feet tall, and this thing was like three-quarters of the way up there where the head was. So he figured it was anywhere between 7 and 8 feet tall. So he called me on Wednesday night and told me about it, and I said, well, I said, I'd love to go out and take a look at the location. So he said, well, how about Friday? So I was in outside sales, so I took a half a day off, on Friday and drove out there and parked on the street and sure enough it was just as he subs- described across the street was this field looked like a farmer's field that hadn't been plowed or used in years and there was a dirt path or a dirt road that went back up into the hills so we walked that and he showed me where the boulder was on the parallel ro- road and we walked behind the hillside and he showed me a footprint that they had discovered when he went out there on Wednesday. Now, my brother was in college preparing to be a police officer, so he had taken criminal investigation, and they covered up the footprint with a cardboard box. And he had done what you're supposed to do. He put a tape measure there and measured it and took several pictures. So when I went out there with him, he removed the box. Now, this is almost a week old, but you could sure see the imprint of a human-shaped foot with... with, uh, Uh, toes, and we decided at that point to follow the path, and if you've ever 
walked through a field, which I know you have. Anybody that walked through it leaves a path. And we followed that path directly back. And we probably walked a mile and a half, two miles back there. This would be about 3.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> and as we got back there, we started running into trees and what I would call reeds or bamboo. And they were crying out loud, 10, 12 feet tall and thick as you can get. And as we got closer to the... Uh, the tree line we heard something back there and what the heck is that so we kept walking and suddenly this huge barn owl <laughs> flew out of the tree <laughs> towards us and scared the living daylights out of us so at that point we got up to where the reeds were and we both looked at each other and i said to him i said we're at least two miles away from the car what are we, what are we going to do if we find, <laughs> find something back here you know run like hell i was 38 he was 25 but even then you know running for two miles with something chasing you. I said, let's get out of here. So at that point, we turned around and, and, and walked back. Uh, at, but I had never heard of any sightings after that. There may have been some, but I don't know of any. But that area, if you look on the map, it goes over the, over the hills to Fillmore and Pyru. Now, that's the area that just caught on fire last week oh, and right. burned to Ventura. If you go past that, you get into the Grapevine area, and that goes almost all the way to Bakersfield. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing back there. I mean, there might be a couple of, you know, dirt trails for, like I said, oil company vehicles or whatever, but there's no, uh, there's no structures back there. There's no settlements. There's no towns. There's nothing. So I, I could see perfectly well the higher they get in the elevation, the, the more thick the uh, scrub oaks and pines and stuff are. That something could live back there undiscovered. And if you go east, after a while, you get up into the uh, the mountains above uh, San Bernardino and Riverside, and there's been plenty of uh, sightings in that area. So I don't see why something couldn't live in there. I just figured it was a rogue uh, young Bigfoot that was curious, and that's why he, tr he was running next to the four-wheeler. And... Uh, Probably remember, looking for food. Right. Do you remember the size of the footprint offhand? It was 15 inches. 15 inches. And it was okay. over five wide. Yeah. Oh. It was a good size foot. So it wasn't like uh, a kid or something was making it. And, I mean, I could see a kid back there riding a four-wheeler or a motorcycle barefoot <coughs> in the summertime, but this was much larger than that. There was a little drainage ditch there. When I say, I would say more of an irrigation ditch. It wasn't deep. It was maybe a foot deep. A uh, foot and a half, two feet wide, and it was just like anybody else that would walk over something like that, put their foot on the far side, and then keep walking. And that's where the footprint was. It was in sand, uh, so there wasn't any vegetation smashed down. That you, we were guessing what it was. It was, it was a pure identified footprint. Mm -hmm. oh, that's so a very interesting, that's, and, and the behavior is yeah. interesting. You know, running alongside the the quad. Um, mm -hmm. And this kid, this guy knew nothing about Bigfoot. He didn't know what he was seeing. That's what scared him. It wasn't like, oh, that must, oh, it was a Bigfoot. I'm getting out of here. He didn't know what a Bigfoot was. And like I said, this was 84, so let's say 20 years after, not even 20 years after the Patterson Gimlin film, I could see a lot of people that weren't interested in something like that sure. would know nothing about it. Yeah, the, even with the film being made, you know, it took a long time for it to really get saturated mm -hmm. in the public mind. Exactly. Yep. To him, it was a monster, you know. Sure. Something that he didn't, he couldn't <clears throat> calculate what that was. Yeah, prior to uh, all this stuff really getting out in the public, they were localized events like that one, and, and that's what people thought of them as. You know, it was very location-specific and didn't really get any coverage. Right. Well, very interesting, Tom. Um did you have any other, uh, you know, final thoughts or anything you wanted to? Uh... <clears throat> no, the o the only other thing, and you can cut this off if you want. I was going to ask you after your sighting, <clears throat> when you were a kid, did you ever think later on that such and such happened to me before that sighting, and think that that could have been a Bigfoot? Yeah, Sounds in the woods. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, when I was yeah. uh, when I was about ten. Now. My my the first time we saw anything, I was fourteen. We saw footprints mm -hmm. and right. had no idea what that was. And then two years later, I actually had an encounter with two creatures. 
but back backing up when I was 10 years old, I, or around 10, uh, this was in about 1968, we lived a few miles away from where we moved to when I was, you know, at, saw the footprints and had the encounter. Uh, so right. it, was, it was in the same ballpark area. Mm-hmm. We, uh, I was out riding my bike, and we lived at the very end of this dirt road. There were only two other homes on this road um, in a heavily forested area near the Puyallup River. And I, I remember our, our cattle, they sort of had a pattern that they would do every day. You know, so We knew exactly where mm-hmm. they were throughout the day, depending on the time. And right. I come riding my bike up, and my, my mother and, and a couple of my two younger sisters were standing out there by the barn, looking at the cows. Well, the cows were all, all up in the barn, facing out with their ears up, very intently looking at something. Mm-hmm. And something mm-hmm. in the tree Waiting line for was, something to come. Yeah. Well, the tree line was about 100, I'd say about 150 feet away, you know, going on memory. And it was really right. thick, and there was something at the edge of the tree line just inside of it really thrashing the brush there. I mean, it was really violent. Mm-hmm. And, and it apparently it upset, because see, the cows that time, they should have been way out in, in one of the farthest pastures, and they were up in the right. barn. And my, I, of course, you know, being a kid, I wanted to go see what was out there. And, sure. Uh, and my mom says, no, there's a bear out there. Now, I had, I had an encounter, a very close encounter with a bear out there during that time period. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when I, being a kid, of course, I was pretty inquisitive. And <clears throat> I think the next day or so, I went out there to look where this happened, where we saw this happening. And we, and I, we never did see anything. But right. uh, I went out there and thought, well, you know, my my dad and uh, family friend showed me what the bear tracks looked like, what to watch for, things like that. So I went out there and mm-hmm. I wanted to see the bear bear tracks. Well, there weren't any bear tracks, and it was a pretty sandy area. There was a lot of river sand out there. Didn't see any tracks. Of course, you know, I might not have been looking in the right place, but if it was a bear, yeah, right. you know, bears yep. leave tracks everywhere. They're They're not very particular about this, so... I never saw any bear tracks. In fact, after we hunted the bear, when I first had the encounter, we never saw the bear again or any sign of it out there. Um, mm-hmm. So looking back, I'm thinking, well, maybe it was a Sasquatch because locals called what was being seen around there the rock quarry monster. Mm-hmm. And in fact, that same year, a kid about my age come riding up to our house in the middle of the night. Well, middle of the night. It was, it was dark. It was probably 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. Sure. But... As far back as we lived, and there were no street lights or anything on a dirt road back there, so it was very unusual. I saw I saw his uh, light on his bicycle bobbing as he was coming up the road. <laughs> so he was going fast. Yeah, he, he was, and he come pounding on the door. Just you know, he it was like he was in shock. He was just you know beside himself, scared. Right. And then he said he he saw the rock quarry monster, and I guess he just took off <laughs> and headed our way. <laughs> and um, you know my you know my parents. Of course, they didn't believe any of that, and that was the first thing I heard sure. anything unusual in the area. Because you know, I was out there in the brush all the time, you know, <laughs> pretty pretty much lived yep. out in the forest. So, but yep. look at, but looking back, absolutely, I think, oh yeah, you know, maybe that's what it was. Sure, sure. Well, my what you mentioned about the footprints, my brother said that he didn't see this footprint until they came back. He didn't see it going up there, and they walked the same same path. So, what whatever caught his attention. The, the toes or something, then they stopped and looked, you know. Sometimes it's and just a matter of... And that's when you saw the, saw the footprint. Yeah, it's a matter of angle and lighting. Sure. Um, yep, exactly. I was going to say, just the way the light hit it. Yep. I, I saw a line of bear tracks up on the Klamath River a few years back, and um, you it didn't see them going in there. I was hiking around the mm-hmm. area, and they were fresh tracks, big tracks, you know, probably big mm-hmm. 400-pound bear, and uh, it was just a matter of the angle. I have to be coming from a different angle coming back upstream, and I and I saw this line of tracks and I thought, wow, that's very interesting. Right. Well, the the only other one that's, that I ask you that because the only other incident that and I I never saw anything. It was just peculiar. Uh, when I was in college, this would be 60, 1969, uh, Two other friends of of mine and I went up through the gold rush country of California, and we stopped a night in Placerville, mm-hmm. out in. Uh, some campground, whatever, and we always parked someplace away from everybody else. And this was in the fall, so the tourists and stuff had all gone, anyways. And we stayed there for a day. And we, we this was a we, we traveled up there in a Ford or a Ford van, and we slept in the back. We had sleeping bags and just slept in the back. So 
we went swimming the next day and came back to the van and on the the side where the door opens up there was a huge i don't know how to describe it, it looked like a watermark that covered both doors almost to the top of the van to the bottom now we were probably 10 15 feet from this bank that was as tall as the van mm-hmm. and there was no mark that it was a water balloon uh, there was actually there was actually no water down at the bottom of the doors. I mean, it could have been. We figured it could have been probably done the night before, but <laughs> it's going to be sound, sound part of, sort of crude. But I always <laughs> thought, could that be a Bigfoot up there taking a leak? <laughs> well, spraying you never on the know. van. I mean... I, I'm, yeah, you never know. But I mean, it was just curious that there was this big water mark covering both doors, and no sign of what that had been. And I mean, we we got out and saw the the van every single day while we were traveling up there for a week so i mean we would have noticed it just like we did the first time we saw it you know it sort of but, brings, uh, the, <laughs> bring, it sort of brings the the mental image you know the jacks links commercials when they first started putting those out <laughs> exactly and they, they put the big things yeah. handy sleeping put it in a, in a pan of warm water <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> and it sprays yep. all over the guy doing it <laughs> exactly exactly and i couldn't figure out what the i mean it couldn't have been Anything else, you know, nothing else could reach that high. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, and you Not know, a, the thing is, you never know. You don't know. Yeah, I know. It could have been done. It could have been done while we were uh, swimming, and it was hot enough. It would have, you know, anything that was on the ground could have evaporated, but and it just left a stain. You know, I mean, a, a urine stain would would, would it would be, cause a stain. Yeah, there there are Not cases. That's just water, where, you know. There are cases where I, I know these things have marked territory. And, oh, yeah. Yep. And, and especially encroaching on places. I, I'm dealing with some individuals right now and in different locations around the country. And I get this a lot, actually. You know, listeners, uh, mm-hmm. if they're curious, know that I actually have people contact me wanting to get rid of these things because they're encroaching, getting too close to the oh, homes. Yeah. Uh, one of the ways uh, my contacts uh, who, who deal with this uh, have told me is to go out and mark your territory. You know, mm-hmm. and, and urinating around their properties is <laughs> one of the and things. And you'll, ups, you'll upset them because they smell it. And, and it's and not now, out of the yeah, question. You, you're sort of claiming their territory, yeah. Well, you're sort of reclaiming your own territory. So it's, yeah. it's theoretically But, I mean, possible. they think it's their territory, yeah. Right, so theoretically, I mean, and animals, lots of animals do this. And in sure. that exact way, they urinate in places making a claim for their territory. If you were to encroach on their territory and, and, and individuals particularly territorial it's conceivable that it did urinate on the van to claim the territory mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i mean of course it's it's an unknown we're speculating but oh, yeah, of it, course. it's an interesting thought yeah of course and i mean there's always you know if you don't bring these things up i mean you know, once 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 you do, you start like I asked you before about prior experiences. All of a sudden, you know, I've heard that story before. Maybe there's something to it. You know. Well, just like what you when you mentioned about the creature running alongside the quad, I can't tell you mm-hmm. how many times I've heard of that exact kind of behavior. It's much more prevalent than people know. Mm-hmm. And a, another side note, uh, I was told by my sources that they don't like quads. Um, they, they, oh, they I could see that, the noise, and yeah, right. They sometimes will exhibit a very aggressive, almost angry yep. behavior. Yep. Well, they didn't mention anything about, you know, noises, growls, mm-hmm. howls, um, you know, coming towards them, doing anything. He was just running parallel to the quad, looking at them, you know. Yeah, and a 15-inch so, track was most likely an adult. Could have been a young adult. It's hard telling. Um, yeah, yeah. But, you know, the creature in the, in the Patterson film left a, a, a print just a little over 14 inches long, and that one appears mm-hmm. to be an adult. So uh, my guess is a 15-inch track was probably an adult. Yeah. Well, like I said on my post on, the, on Facebook, I didn't know if it was any of interest to you. You might want to just keep it for reference for some time when you're writing or for your notes or whatever, but that's, that's the experience we had. Well, very interesting, Tom. I certainly appreciate that, and I and I sure you're welcome. Appreciate your time. Oh, no problem. Um, like I said, I've never told this to anybody. We've always talked about it when we get together, family-wise, once in a while. But uh, as far as you know, sitting down and talking to someone about it, I've never done that before. So, 
and that's the case with the vast majority of people out there that have had experiences you know they either keep it to themselves it's a family or friends type thing even my own mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. until i met john green and renee de hendon i kept it very quiet amongst my close friends who had seen some of the evidence themselves and we weren't about to talk about it outside yeah well i'm not ashamed to talk about it i wouldn't i'm not afraid of being ridiculed because especially nowadays sure you know at least if you, if you say bigfoot or sasquatch 90 percent of people would know what you're talking about even if they don't believe it or whatever but even in, in those days there just wasn't anybody that would was interested exactly that was my own case too i it wasn't that I wouldn't have talked about it, but, uh, it, you know, until I met those guys, there wasn't anybody mm-hmm. that, wanted, that wanted to hear it. Right. <clears throat> All right, Tim, well, listen, thank you for your time. Oh, you're and, welcome. Thanks for calling. I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be airing this show today, so I'll send okay. you a copy. Great. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you, my friend. You're welcome. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone, for joining me this week. Be sure to tune in again next week as we explore another account from a witness of the unknown.